A very good evening aspirants. I have a very good announcement for you. See there is a very famous quote by Abraham Lincoln which says, "If I had 8 hours to chop down a tree, I would spend 6 hours sharpening my axe." Similarly, to successfully clear prelims, you have to give a lot of mock tests as much as possible. And just to help you towards your goal, Shankar IAS Academy is conducting all India preliminary mock test see you really don't have to pay for this test because this test is free you can use this test to sharpen your strategy the mock test will be conducted across 13 centers in both online and offline modes and it will be held on three different dates the first test will be starting on 15th of may 2022 so don't forget to register for the examination The registration link is in the description and in a one click away you can register for the examination and just prepare for your mock test make use of this opportunity and with this positive note let us move on to the news article discussion see today we have four different news articles in this first news article discussion we will be discussing about whistle blowers we will be seeing about their significance and issues faced by them and some of the legal protections provided by government to the whistle blowers so following that our second news article discussion will be about swapping policy for electric vehicles then we'll be seeing a news article discussion regarding mangrove forest and finally we'll end our discussion by discussing about chola dynasty so now without wasting much time let us get into the news article discussion today let us start our discussion with this news article discussion Look at this article. This article talks about Miss Sophie Zhang, who is a data scientist and a whistleblower. She worked at Facebook between 2018 and 2020. She worked in site integrity fake engagement team, which was created to deal with bot accounts. While investigating these fake accounts, Miss Zhang she uncovered abusive political manipulation and opposition harassment networks in 25 countries, including India. She was about to depose before the Standing Committee on Communication and Information and Technology. So here, deposition is a formal written statement made by a witness, which can be used in a court of law if the witness cannot be present. But the parliamentary rules require speakers' consent for witnesses to participate in meetings through video conference from abroad. So the permission was sought from the speaker to allow Miss Zhang's deposition. the speaker is yet to take the decision and this is the news here so with this as a background we we'll learn about whistle blowers today their importance issues faced by them a legal protection given by government for whistle blowers before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference just go through it first of all who is a whistle blower See whistle blowers reports illegal activities within an organization. A whistle blower is a person who could be an employee of a company or a government agency who disclose information to the public or some higher authority about any wrongdoings which could be in the form of fraud, corruption, etc. A whistle blower could be a employee, contractor or a supplier who becomes aware of any illegal activities. So have this basic understanding. There are two types of whistle blowers. They are internal whistle blowers and external whistle blowers. Internal whistle blowers are those who report the misconduct, fraud or indiscipline to senior officers of the organization such as head human resource or CEO. External whistle blowing is a term used when whistle blowers report the wrongdoings to people outside the organization such as the media, higher government officials or police. Now what is the significance of whistle blowing? Is it right to do it? See whistle blowing is one of the most effective way to detect and prevent corruption and other mal practices. Whistle blowers disclosures have exposed wrong doings and fraud, helped to save millions in public funds, avoid disasters for health, environment, etc. Whistle blowers important role in safeguarding the public good is repeatedly proved by the scandals they uncover such as industry scale tax avoidance like Panama papers and money laundering like Danske bank scandal many like that many more cases of wrong doings could have been prevented if more people had come forward to expose problems to their organizations the authorities or the media unfortunately reporting often comes at a high price 
whistle blowers risk their career their livelihood and sometimes their personal safety to expose wrong doings that threatens the public interest they may be fired sued blacklisted arrested threatened or in extreme cases even assaulted or killed and in some societies whistle blowing carries connotations of betrayal rather than being seen as a benefit to the public the three main reasons people give for not reporting corruption are firstly fear of consequences like legal financial and reputational consequences secondly the belief that nothing will be done that it will not make any difference thirdly uncertainty about how where and to whom to report see protecting whistle blowers from unfair treatment including retaliation discrimination or disadvantage can give courage to people to report wrong doings so companies public bodies and non profit organizations should introduce mechanisms for internal reporting see a protective environment for whistle blowers is crucial to allow them to report instances of mal practices without having to face the dilemma of doing the right thing and risking one's career or remaining silent at the expense of the public good in india whistle blowers are protected by the whistle blowers protection act 2014 See the Whistle Blowers Protection Act 2014 enables any person that is a whistle blower to report an act of corruption willful misuse of power or discretion or criminal offence by a public servant this includes all public servants including ministers members of parliament the lower judiciary regulatory authorities central and state government employees etc such disclosures are made to a specified competent authority who must conduct a discreet inquiry and conceal the identity of the complainant and public servant that is the act specifies the competent authority for each category of public servant for example it would be the prime minister for a union minister speaker or chairman for members of parliament the chief justice of the high court for district court judges the central or state vigilance commission for government servants and remember competent authority has the power to issue appropriate direction to the concerned government authorities including police which should take necessary steps to protect such complainant or public servant or persons concerned the competent authority has also had a responsibility to protect the identity of the complainant and documents or informations furnished by him the competent authority also prepares a consolidated annual report of the performance of its activities and submit it to the central or state government that will be further laid before each house of parliament or state legislature remember the act prohibits two categories of information from being disclosed this included information related to sovereignty strategy scientific or economic interest of india foreign relations or the incitement of an offence and secondly proceedings of the council of ministers the act is not applicable to the special protection group or spg personnel and officers constituted under the special protection group act 1988 remember this fact not that any person who reveals the identity of a complainant will be punishable with imprisonment for a term extending up to 3 years and a fine which may extend up to 50000 rupees see strengthening of the whistle blower protection mechanism will help in ensuring that the integrity of democracy is protected cherished and upheld so that's all about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw about whistle blowers we saw who is the whistle blower in that we saw two types of whistle blowers namely the internal whistle blower and the external whistle blower then we saw the significance of whistle blowing and finally we saw some of the features of the whistle blowing protection act 2014 so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now let us see this article that was in the business page see this article is about the draft battery swapping policy released by niti ayog see the policy is targeted at electric two and three wheelers as the government think tank aims to expedite large scale adoption of electric vehicles so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn more about the battery swapping policy see we all know india has committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2070 at the 26th conference of parties or cop 26 in november 2021 right this will require clear pathways to decarbonize high greenhouse gas or ghg intensive sectors such as transport and energy 
so to decarbonize transport the transition to clean mobility led by electric vehicles or evs is very important so that is why electric vehicles are given more importance and with this commitment now let us see about the electronic vehicles see electric vehicles are traditionally purchased with fixed batteries which can only be charged using the power supply while housed within the electric vehicle like petrol diesel fueling stations for internal combustion engines vehicles adequate affordable accessible and reliable charging networks are a prerequisite for mass electric vehicle adoption efforts are underway in india to boost the availability of charging infrastructure but the problem here is charging takes significantly longer than refueling an internal combustion engine and this is where battery swapping becomes relevant and it is seen as an alternative to charging the electric vehicles see battery swapping means exchanging discharged batteries for charged ones and providing flexibility to charge them separately so this delinks charging and battery usage and keeps the vehicle in operational mode with negligible downtime see this battery swapping is generally used for small vehicles such as two wheelers and three wheelers with smaller batteries that are easy to swap compared to four wheelers and e buses so here battery swapping offers three key advantages relative to charging the first one is time next is space because there will be no need for multiple charging stations and thirdly it is cost efficient provided each swappable battery is actively used and with this understanding now let us see about the other features of the policy see battery swapping falls under the broader umbrella of battery as a service business models which involve users purchasing an electric vehicle without the battery which significantly lowers upfront cost and paying a regular subscription fee like daily weekly or monthly etc see this fee is to the service providers for battery services throughout the vehicle lifetime and the policy stipulates the minimum technical and operational requirements that battery swapping ecosystems would need to fulfill and this is to enable effective efficient reliable safe and customer friendly implementation of battery swapping infrastructure and the policy also highlights the possible ways in which various national and subnational government agencies and public sector enterprises or pscs may provide direct and indirect financial support to battery providers for the cost of the batteries and electric vehicle users for the upfront cost of purchasing electric vehicles with the aim of driving electric vehicle adoption by lowering the cost of electric vehicles for users relatively to internal combustion engine vehicles Apart from this the policy emphasizes enabling innovation in adoption of possible business models and de-risking the investment in required infrastructure to encourage private sector participation and attract affordable financing and more importantly the policy underlines the importance of reuse of end of first life swappable batteries and recycling of end of life batteries and the policy also lays the groundwork to create unique battery codes for acc batteries falling under this policy finally this policy lays down an institutional framework to facilitate on ground implementation of the required battery swapping infrastructure and to realize the stated policy objectives and that is all about the overview of the policy in this news article discussion we saw why this draft battery swapping policy is necessary then we saw about battery swapping we saw what actually battery swapping means battery swapping is nothing but exchanging discharged batteries for charged ones and providing flexibility to charge them separately so this process actually delinks charging and battery usage and keeps the vehicle in operational mode with negligible downtime then we saw some of the advantages of battery swapping then we finally saw about some of the important features of the draft policy so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it is about the pichavaram mangroves see pichavaram mangrove forest in the coastal kadalu district is a storehouse of biodiversity 
and it is considered the second largest in the country after West Bengal's Sundarbans. See, at present on both the sides of the Velar and Kolerone rivers, it is a unique ecosystem spread over 1000 hectares. But however, Pichavaram has not found the place it deserves on the tourism map of India and this is the essence of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about mangroves and the points that are mentioned in the article regarding Pichavaram. First of all, what are mangroves? See, mangroves are diverse group of salt tolerant plant communities. They commonly occur in tropical and subtropical intertidal regions of the world that is between latitude 24 degree north and 38 degree south. Interestingly, they exhibit varied morphological and physiological evolutionary adaptations to survive. See, mangroves can be seen in intertidal region. So, the challenging factor like lack of oxygen, high salinity and diurnal tidal inundation all will be present. In order to overcome these, plant adopt to some kind of adaptation. For example, succulent leaves, sunken stomata, aerial breathing roots called nematopores, vivipari, stilt roots, buttresses, etc. or some of the adaptations exhibited by mangroves. And the specific regions where these plants occur are termed as mangrove ecosystem. They are highly protective but extremely sensitive and fragile. Remember these facts and with this basic understanding about the mangroves, now let us see about the distribution of mangroves in India. See the distribution of mangrove ecosystem on Indian coastlines indicates that the Sundarban mangrove occupy very large area followed by Andaman Nicobar Islands and Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat. Rest of the mangrove ecosystem is comparatively smaller. Here is the list of states which have mangroves. Just go through it. Very important fact that you have to remember with respect to prelims. Now coming to Pichavaram mangroves. As we already saw, this mangrove is actually sandwiched between two primitive estuaries, the Vellar estuary in the north and Kolerun estuary in the south. The Vellar Kolerun estuary complex forms the Kilai backwater and Pichavaram mangroves. The source of fresh water to this mangrove is from both the estuaries and that of sea water in Bay of Bengal. Very very important fact, make note of them. Well according to the article, it is said that the tourism potential of the place has not been fully realized. This is because at most the visitors are taken on a boat ride through the numerous cracks in the ecosystem. See at present Tamil Nadu Tourism Development Corporation or TTDC operates a boathouse. And according to forest department, eco-friendly cottages and dormitories were damaged during the 2004 tsunami. Since then, no efforts were taken by the government to restore the damage caused by the tsunami. The revenue from the boat rides goes to Irular community. The rest is spent on the welfare of tribal families in traditional settlements in the area. See, the ecosystem should be protected because Mangroves are the first line of defense for coastal communities and play a major role in minimizing the impacts of natural disasters like tsunami, floods and cyclones. And according to the article, the biggest threat in the area is the proliferation of shrimp farms. See, the farms are illegally drawing water from the natural creeks in the mangrove ecosystem. Apart from this, irresponsible visitors littering sensitive areas are also a cause for concern. Owing to this reason, government planned a master plan for the development of Pichavaram with help of locals. The proposal included development of eco-friendly stays for visitors and other service infrastructure. The idea is to involve the local communities in the activities and generate revenue for them. This is a step in promoting sustainable community-based tourism. This is crucial because the local communities, that is Irulas, and their knowledge of ecosystem and its biodiversity is a great asset. So that's all you have to know about from this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw about mangroves. We saw some of its unique features. Then we saw the distribution of mangrove ecosystem in India. And finally, we saw in brief about Pichavaram mangroves and some of the issues with respect to the ecosystem. So with these learn points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here. It is about the temple in Kone Rajapuram. See it was constructed by Sembian Mahadevi as per the inscriptions and the hymns of Saivit saints Tirunavakarasar 
and Tiranyana Samandar. See, the temple is also where the tallest bronze Nadraja idol of the Chola period is located and this is the essence of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about the Chola Empire from Purim's point of view. See, as you know, powerful kingdoms had risen in southern India during the 6th and 8th centuries. Among them, Pallavas and Pandyas dominated Tamil Nadu and, and the Cheras dominated the modern Kerala and the Chalukyas dominated the Deccan area. See, the Chola Empire rose in the 9th century which dominated a large part of the peninsula. With this basic info, let us see some of the important facts of the Chola Empire. See, the empire is founded by Vijayalaya. He was a feudatory of Pallavas. He captured Tanjur in 850 AD. At the end of 9th century, Chola defeated Pallavas of Kanji and weakened Pandyas. This brought the entire South Tamil region under their control. Now we will see some of the important Chola rulers. The greatest Chola ruler were Rajaraja and his son Rajendra I. See, Rajaraja destroyed the Chera navy at Trivandrum and attacked Quilan. He conquered Madurai and captured Pandya king. He also invaded Sri Lanka and annexed its northern part to the Chola Empire. One of his naval exploits include the conquest of Maldives and he annexed the northwestern parts of the Ganga kingdom in Karnataka and Rajendra I, he carried forward the annexationist policy of his father Rajaraja. Rajendra completely overran Pandya and Chera kingdoms. He also fully annexed Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka was not able to free herself from the Chola Empire for another 50 years. One of the most remarkable exploits is the march across Kalinga to Bengal in which the Chola armies crossed Ganga river and defeated two local kings. To commemorate this occasion, Rajendra I assumes the title of Gangai Kunda Chola that is the Chola who conquered the Ganga. He built a new capital in the mouth of Kaveri river and called it as Gangai Kunda Cholapuram. So in this map you can see the extent of the Chola Empire. See the Chola sent naval expeditions to Sri Vijaya Empire which includes Malaya Peninsula, Sumatra, Java and neighboring islands. And the Vijaya Empire controlled trade route to China. In order to remove obstacles to Indian traders and to expand trade with China, Chola conquested Kadaram and a number of other places in Malay Peninsula and Sumatra. The Chola Navy was the strongest and for some period the Bay of Bengal was called the Chola Lake. See, the Chola Empire continued to flourish till 13th century. After that, Chola was taken down by the Pandyas and Hoshalyas. So, with these basic understanding, now let us see the characteristics of the empire. See the king was the important person in the Chola administration. All authority rested with him and he had a council of ministers to advise him. Cholas maintained large army consisting of elephant, cavalry, infantry. They are called the three limbs of the army. The Cholas also had a strong navy which dominated Malabar and Coromandel coast and for some time the entire Bay of Bengal. The Chola state included area of central control. The basic unit of administration is called Nadu which consisted a number of villages having a close kinship. Nadus were grouped into Valanadus and the entire Chola state were divided into four mandalams or provinces. Sometimes princes of the royal family were appointed as the governors of the provinces. See make note of these words. There might be a question in the preliminary examination. Apart from this, the Cholas built a network of roads which were used for trade and the movement of the army. The Chola also paid attention to irrigation. Many tanks for irrigation were built. Water from Kaveri and other rivers were used for the purpose. Now coming to revenue, the Cholas drew income from land tax, toll on trade, tax on professions and also from the plunder of the neighboring countries. Coming to the cultural part, see the temple architecture in the south attained its climax under the Cholas. The style of architecture that was prevalent during this period was Dravidian style of architecture. The main feature of the style is building many story above the Garbhagraha. This is the innermost chamber where the chief deity resides and the number of stories above came to be called as Vimana. We know that right? 
a pillared hall called mandapa with carved structures and flat roof were generally placed in front of the sanctum it acted as an audience hall and a place for ceremonial dances performed by devadasis an example for such an architecture include brahadeeshwara temple in tanjore built by raja raja 1 so that's all you have to know about chola empire in this news article discussion we in briefly saw about chola dynasty so with these learn points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is nothing but the preliminary practice questions now look at this first question consider the following statements with reference to mangroves in india statement 1 in india mangroves can be only seen in west bengal and andaman and nicobar islands statement 2 mangroves are tropical and soil tolerant plants which of the above statements is or are correct option a one only option b two only option c both one and two and option d neither one nor two see the correct answer for the question is option b two only first statement is incorrect see in the discussion itself we saw a map regarding this right the distribution of mangrove ecosystem on indian coastlines indicates that the sundarban mangroves occupy very large area followed by andaman nicobar islands and gulf of kutch in gujarat rest of the mangrove ecosystems is comparatively smaller 10 coastal states in india have mangrove distribution in different amounts so statement 1 is incorrect here now moving on to statement 2 statement 2 is correct because as we saw in the discussion mangroves are diverse group of salt tolerant plant communities they commonly occur in tropical and subtropical intertidal regions of the world that is between latitude 24 degree north and 38 degree south and also they exhibit varied morphological and physiological evolutionary adaptations to survive we saw that right so second statement is correct here so the correct answer for the question is option b two only now moving on now look at this second question this question is about chola empire consider the following statements with reference to the chola empire statement 1 the founder of chola dynasty was raja raja chola statement 2 chola empire had army with elephants cavalry and infantry but they did not have any naval force which of the above statements is or are correct option a one only option b two only option c both one and two and option d neither one not two So the correct answer for the question is option D neither one nor two. See statement one is incorrect because the Chola dynasty was founded by Vijayalaya Chola in 850 AD. So the founder is not Raja Raja Chola it is Vijayalaya he was a feudatory of Pallavas. Now moving on to second statement second statement is also incorrect because see in our discussion we saw that Chola empire had army with elephant cavalry and infantry. This part is correct. but the second part is incorrect because in the discussion itself we saw that the chola navy is the strongest one in the area so the second part of this statement is incorrect we saw that it annexed sri lanka held expeditions to malaya peninsula sumatra and java right and even bay of bengal is called a chola lake so this statement is incorrect now the correct answer for this question is option d neither one nor two displayed here are the mains questions for today's discussion just go through the questions write an answer and post it in the comment section with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and share and don't forget to subscribe shankarais academy youtube channel thank you